Hello, a good day to everyone. It's great to see so many of you again coming back and back to all our webinars. So today we are going to show you the new features and functions of ISAMSurf 2019 and we hope you like them. And um, this webinar um, is, is going to be recorded as usual and you will receive the link to the recording tomorrow in the afternoon after this webinar. Also, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand in the question window and write it down. We will collect them and we will have a Q&A session afterwards. And now I hand over to Nick. Have fun. Thanks, Honorata. Hello, everybody. It's Nick McFerrin from the UK. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm uh, in the Katia Design Center of Excellence. Um, I've been using Ice from Surf since about 1997, so I consider myself just out of the novice stages. So I'm very pleased to be presenting to you um, the, uh, the What's New for Ice from Surf 2019. Um, you'll see through the presentation this incredible concept car, a portrait of DB. Um, this car was created in Ice from Surf um, by these three guys on the right, Takumi, Cyril and Alexandre. Uh, it's an homage to David Bowie, inspired by his music and his imagery. So we're very pleased to be able to use this today. Now, as you know, DASO systems support uh, surface refinement um, across three columns now. So we have ISOMSURF, which is the best-in-class explicit modeler that we know and love. We have the new product, ISOM Design Experience, which is very exciting, just came out uh, 2019X on the 3D Experience platform and of course we have Katia ISOM which is in V5 and the 3D Experience platform also but today is all about ISOM Surf. So uh, for continuity and innovation so we uh, intend to continue to deliver the best in class explicit class A solution. Uh, it is the, uh, the reference for surfacing um, and we uh, plan to continue our customer engagement. We get our enhancement requests from our customers. We wish to consolidate the product portfolio and improve the interoperability between our products like Katia and Delta Gen. Um, we are very keen to support our academic customers um, pushing it for students. So that's very important to us also. So you can see the development of ISOMSURF continues to increase uh, the various numbers of enhancements and products that have been added over the years. So in 2019, it's no different. We have one new command and 34 enhancements, which are all customer enhancements. So they're very relevant. I hope you like them. So the agenda for this call, it should take about an hour. Hopefully, I've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to have to go pretty quickly. Um, we're going to discuss a little bit about packaging changes. The main event is the, the highlights, clearly. And then we're going to look briefly at the uh, licensing operating system and any additional infos. So uh, the big change for packaging is that um, ISOMSURF HMD is no longer controlled availability. It is now general availability. That basically means it's supplied on the, the GA media that everybody gets. And it's also included in ISOMSURF for academia. So these are the different uh, modules of ISOMSURF. Um, no big changes here, but you can see that uh, ISOMSURF HMD is GA, stands for general availability. Um, for ISOMSURF HMD, the prerequisites are K24, that's ISOMSURF Professional, and ISOMSURF Real-Time Renderer. We offer two packages right now, the Reverse Engineering Package and the ISOMSURF Virtual Modeling Package, and no changes here. Uh, and for the educational bundles, uh, the change is that we've added ISOMSURF HMD to the academic bundle. So let's talk about the highlights. I'm going to use a mixture of videos and live demos because uh, that's the way I like to do it. There are four areas where we've uh, made significant enhancements, modeling, diagnosis, visualization, ergonomics, and data workflow. So right off the bat, so this is one of my favorite ones. We finally added dynamic snapping. Now, um, there's a little video here, which I'll show you. Um, what this basically means is uh, before when we use keyboard shortcuts to snap to specific locations like corner points or curve endpoints or edges or face edges and things like that, we can now use a dynamic snap. So what's happening in this video here is uh, we're going to pick up this central feature 
um, and using dynamic move, we're going to, uh, there we go, we're going to make a couple of copies of this to make a, a new uh, grill feature. So I'm holding down, you'll see in the video, if I hold down the U key, it's snapping to the face edge. And I'm making copies. So these shortcuts, they work with um, nearly all of the uh, positional shortcuts, which uh, make it very fun and useful. So I'm gonna stop this and just show you a little bit of live. I prefer to do it that way. So I'm going to go to my ISOM surf, here it is. So um, let's take a look at this uh, curve, for example, it doesn't really matter which one I'm using. Okay, so if I pick up this uh, endpoint, I can just move it around. But now if I hold down my A key, you'll see it's snapping to the curve. Here we go. You can, in your preferences, you can change the size of that little red circle. You can make it bigger or smaller. That's kind of the snap radius. If I hold C, you'll see it's not snapping to the curve anymore, but it will snap to the endpoint. And coming down here, I can press my H, so that's going to go into the corner point, or I can do O for the control point on the patch, and so on. So I think uh, I think this is a fantastic enhancement. I'm using I now. It also supports W, which will put it onto the current plane. And there's also the spacebar option, which kind of lets it choose what it thinks you want. And you see it stays red the whole time, so this is an automatic snapping function. I personally prefer the uh, getting it exactly right so that there's no confusion about what's going on. So that's dynamic snap. I think that's a really great new enhancement. Okay. So, um, okay, so uh, we've now got uh, a new change to modify curve segment. You'll see on the screen, at the bottom of the screen, that's what it looked like in 2018. Now in 2019, we've added uh, a new little uh, table on the left-hand side in yellow. What this is, um, I don't know if you agree with me here, but when, when you're moving control points around in a patch, you, you know exactly where they're gonna go, more or less, with normal tangent and offset. But with curve modification, sometimes, it's particularly for new users, I found it a little tricky sometimes. So what we've done is we've added the directional controls or locks, if you like, that you know from patching, from patch modification, sorry, to curve modification. So we have tangent, normal, and offset. So I'll just show you how they work. So um, here we go. So you'll see the, the dialogue looks different now. We've got normal, tangent, normal, and offset on the left, and we've got the, the classic one on the right. The classic one overrides the new one. You should know that, okay? But so if I just pick tangent here, this means that I can take this control point, and depending on which side of it I pick, just like in patch, it moves down the tangent. Now the difference is if I do tangent on this side, you'll see what it does is it's maintaining the tangency to the nearest endpoint. So I can move this one anywhere. And this would be a little confusing because this is not a tangent motion, is it? It's just maintaining the tangency over here. So that's the difference. Okay, normal works by striking a normal off the, uh, off the curve beneath it. That's the normal direction, just like in patch. And offset will offset the whole curve. So that's another really great enhancement to your modeling. We've made a change to the matching dialogue. I, uh, I know we keep changing this, but this is a really great enhancement here. Um, for me, it really makes sense. It's, uh, it's a little bit bigger, yes, but on the left-hand side at 2018, you know, it looks a little bit messy. And we have these drop-down boxes for projection and mapping. Okay, so this required two clicks to change what you wanted. So from uh, projection uh, down a vector to projection normal, it was two clicks. Now on the right hand side, we've got radio buttons. So it makes for a much more efficient workflow. You get exactly what you want in one click instead of two. So for me, it's yes, it's a little bit bigger, but we've made other enhancements to the uh, UI that you'll see later that, that minimize the impact this is going to have on your screen space. So, um, other enhancements that we've added, I'm uh, very pleased to see some of these. Um, now we've got here where my mouse is, this is the swap sides. We finally made it a graphical symbol like uh, in, in other parts of the software. 
we've added a duplicate button to matching. This was an enhancement request from our friends in the Czech Republic, I think. Um, very pleased to see this one. Uh, what this means is that before you make your match, you can duplicate your original surface just in case you, you didn't you didn't want to change it or you want to go back to it easily if you go beyond more than one undo. So it's a nice user enhancement. And down at the bottom there, the variant buttons, V1, V2, V3, this is fantastic. So it's true we have a rather large matching command, but it's it's an important command. It's one that we use all the time, but it's, yes, it's a little bit big. So what we've done is we've added these V1, V2, V3 shortcut buttons. And these are the top three variants for your matching command. Let me uh, show you what I mean here. So here is just a couple of patches. I'll switch off my shading, go for a match. Okay. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Under here, I've got saved uh, a selection of matching variants. So basically, I can choose between these. This is not new. This has existed for some time. And you'll see that the different options are selected according to my personal choices. That's fine. But take a look over here, V1, V2, V3. Look what's happening. So the top three matching variants have automatically been assigned to these shortcut buttons. And also I get the pop-up help reminding me which one it is because you decide what these are called. So this is curve min projection, sim t4 and v3. So I'll come back to sim t4 in a little in a little bit. But I think this is a great new enhancement. So I can do my matching really quickly. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. So uh, I made a reference to uh, symmetry. So what we've done, you might have noticed it, we have these two options, Tor 3 and Tor 4. For the symmetry matching command, this is what they're for. This is where they apply. This gives you the choice to decide which control point row will be used for torsional matching, okay? If you click the Tor 3 box, that means it's going to move the third control point row. If you pick the Tor 4, it's going to be the fourth one, okay? So let me show you how that works. So this is uh, just a simple patch. I'm gonna put on my mirror and uh, let's take a look at my curvature. Cross Y zero, there it is. All right, so you can see straight away that it's not a great matching of cross Y zero. We have a torsional discontinuity. All right, so let's match it with the new command. So I'm gonna go for my Tor Sim 4, and you'll notice that these uh, options have been picked for me. I'm just gonna, just for the sake of the presentation, just switch that off for now. So look closely at the third control point row. I'm gonna switch off blend. There you go, see what's happening? So the third control point row is moving, but the fourth and fifth are not. Naturally, I could switch on blend if I wanted to, but I'm not so happy with this, to be honest. So what I want to do, I'd like to use the fourth control point row only to see if I can get a better condition. So I'm going to go to there, I'm going to activate the four and uh, let's see what happens. All right, so I'm a lot more happy with this. It's not really changing my base patch too much and I'm getting a nice matching condition across Y0. So that's Tor 3 and Tor 4. Now there's a short video here which shows exactly what I've just done live, so I don't think I need to show you that. Okay, so um, we've made some changes to uh, Create Patch Blend. There are one or two changes to that. So the first one is we've added the, uh, the minimum radius check. Okay, so this is a nice feature which is uh, similar to the Curve Blend capability you saw in ISOM Surf 2018. So you can see that you can specify, you enable the uh, diagnosis with this tick down here. You type in your minimum radius, and here on the right-hand side, you can see this is actually what the minimum radius is at the time where it's measured. Okay, and then you get this red line if you violate the uh, minimum radius. So I'm gonna show you this in a minute. Another change to uh, blend command is we've added under the shape tab, um, the offset a little bit again, just like curve blend. So what offset does is it takes from your base patches, it takes the first control point row and offset it downwards or upwards according to the slider to give you a little bit of acceleration, a little bit of run in. 
I've got a video that will show you that in a moment. Uh, we've also added the ratio sliders, which work in the same way as curve blend. So it allows you to dynamically, uh, just through sliders, change the shape of your blend surface. Um, we've also included the trim function um, with duplicate. So once again, you don't, if you don't want to lose your original surfaces, tick on duplicate and uh, it'll make a copy for you. So here's a video just showing some of those features on the uh, portrait of DB. So we're going to make a blend surface on the front here. There we go. So the diagnosis is not enabled at the moment. We're going to pop it on. We've got a minimum radius of 40 specified. And there we go. You can see through the dynamic sliders that we're violating that. So we need to take care of that. So it's excellent visual feedback for making sure that your surfaces are validated, you know, at the creation process rather than checking it later down the line. So what we're going to do here is show you how the offset works. You can see that, yes, it's curvature matched, but it could be better. So what we're going to do is we're just going to offset down the first control point row of the base patch and see what happens to our blend surf. There we go. You can see on the on the mirror side, the original surface that's not been moved. I appreciate you changing the base patch is usually not the way it's done, but at least now we have this option. Okay, so um, we've also added a minimum radius check to the Fillet Plus menu. It works in a very similar way. Uh, and here we have the whole new command. I'm, I'm skipping through this quite quickly because we have quite a lot to show you, but I will show you this one. So this is a brand new command, uh, create patch chamfer. Okay, um, it's uh, similar to Fillet. You can see it looks quite the same with the same graphical feedback and the and the uh, the text-based descriptions, but um, it works, yeah, much the same way. And we can also add a crown to it as well. So let me show you how that works. Back to my item surf. Let's take a look at my chamfer. Okay, so we've got some very simple surfaces here. Just a nice feature, like so. Let's go for create chamfer. There it is. So. Uh, simple matter first surface and the second as you might expect oops getting too fast hang on that one and this one there we go all right so just like Philip, we have these uh, directional pointers to show us uh, the normal side and then we can choose the sort of chamfer that we want so we have this nice graphical uh, icon here with some little uh, hints as to exactly what's going on. So this one is a chordal, for example, and the S is referred to the, the surfaces. This is a curve-based one, so the SC means curve. But let's look at a, a pretty basic one. So chamfer and angle. So the chamfer distance is this one here, so it's 15, and the angle is to either the first surface or the second surface, okay? So the first surface was the face at the bottom. So this is going to be a 15 degree one, Switch that off for now. Uh, so let's see what happens. There we go. I'm going to shade that up so you can see what's going on. So that's a 15 degree chamfer to the base, to the bottom of this model, which was surface number one. You can choose surface number two instead and type in whatever number you want. Let's try for 15 again, give you the different result. You'll see here that we've got the limitation. I've set it to face. So this is facing back the base patches. As we do that, we can choose whatever we want. We can say none or even duplicate. There we go, that's the none option. So that doesn't face anything back. And we can also specify a curve-based one. So let's say uh, curve and chamfer. So let's just, for instance, pick this curve here. Oh, of course, that's too far away. So let's make it a little bit bigger. Ah, oh, yeah. all right, so I, I, I picked the bad number here, but um, there we go. We can maybe change a different uh, different one. 
<laughs> it wouldn't be a webinar without a live webinar without these fun and games. Okay, listen, I'm going to move on because I don't want to dwell on this too much. So uh, the new chamfer. Oh, I wanted to show you the crown command. That is good. So hang on, I'll go back to Isomsurf for that. All right, so chamfer, here we are. Let's so go from here to here. And let's choose just a standard one like that. Okay, and let's add some crowning. So crowning can be done by distance or by radius. Now I always used to do it by distance, so I'm gonna go for a minus 0.2 of a mil, and you'll see what happens. There we go, so that's a minus 0.2, and we can also just make that positive and come out as well, the other way. Oops. There we go. A little bit too big to fit around there. We'll make that a bit smaller. So it's a very uh, dynamic, very powerful command. Um, and I think it's going to be really useful. I think you're going to really like it. Okay, moving on. Now here's one that I think has been a long time coming. Um, you know, when you want to make an arc fillet, it always seemed to default to the wrong order, right? So finally now, depending on the type of fillet you choose, be it arc, tangency, curvature, or profile, we've redefined what the default values are. So finally, whenever you specify an arc fillet, it will automatically be seven. You don't need to change it anymore. So uh, this is a very sensible enhancement, uh, certainly from my point of view. Uh, okay, we've uh, added a variable radius to our tube function. Let's take a look at that. It works exactly as you would expect. So I just have a curve. Um, let's go for a tube, and there's my curve there, and we specify a radius, so it's a 2 mil tube, and it's just a simple matter of saying you want a variable radius, choosing what you want, and away you go. Nice feature. Okay. Now this is one for unified modeling. Um, as you will know that when you use shading unified modeling, there's a sort of an override function in the UM menu. This was a little bit awkward and took a little bit of getting used to. What we've done now is we've enabled the standard F1 shading key to work with unified modeling. So let me uh, show you how that works. Um, here we go. So. So here we've got uh, just a more complex model. I hope you can see that. Uh, let's go into UM, just pick some surfaces at the front here. All right. So you'll see that, uh, we don't want that. You'll see that this is uh, where we specify shading for UM. And previously F1 would have no effect here or the shading shortcut would have no effect. But now it overrides that. So I'm hitting F1 with my finger and you see that it works in a more natural, intuitive way. So sometimes you do want to switch off all the shading or you want it all on at the same time. And if you just jump back into the mini uh, display menu here for UM, it takes back control. So whatever you did last is how it's left. I think this makes a lot of sense and uh, makes it easier to use. Okay, um, things that you've seen coming uh, through Surf over the last couple of releases is we've been giving uh, the opportunity or the ability to name your diagnoses and organize them a little bit better. So for matching and curvature diagnoses, um, we have allowed you to uh, give them names and save them with the model and actually save many versions of different uh, analyses, different diagnoses. Okay, because sometimes you want to set up your model and you can have lots of different diagnoses, maybe lots of different matching ones, curvature ones, and uh, it gets a little messy or confusing sometimes. So being able to give them sensible names and organize them in a list and switch them off and on with the tick boxes is really useful. And again, 
to make it a little easier to do, we've added the identify option. What this means is that you can pick graphically off the screen, the diagnostic, and it will pre-select it in the list. Let me show you how that works. So if I go for something like uh, this one. Nope, hang on. <clears throat> so in my curvature matching, here we go. So I've got a few ones here, so I'm going to switch them on for this example. So I've got two different curvature matchings here, but which is which? Now, okay, it's pretty easy for me just to switch them off and on and tell this way, but if I had lots on here, maybe I wasn't familiar with the model, I might want to pick off the graphical screen. So I can say identify and I can pick. So identify and I should pick another one that makes sense. And you'll see how it pre-selected in the list the one that I just selected. Nice little enhancement to make your life easier. So that's for matching and curvature diagnostics. It exists in both now. All right, so um, we've made an enhancement to deviation, which is a sort of, uh, we call it in the inspect button. This works very nicely. I'll show you how that goes. So here we have a simple uh, deviation diagnostic. So let's go into here, go into deviation. And if I now hit the inspect button, I get this instant uh, readback for the, uh, the, different, the different lines here, all right? But we've got a new context sensitive menu. If I right click here, you see I can save a position. So maybe this is a particularly important location that you're quite interested in. We can save that as a diagnostic and it'll stay there. I can save one here, I can save one here. I can also say uh, hide, hide them all, or I can say show them all. So they're remembered with the model. And then of course I can just hit reset and start over. So this is a great little kind of dynamic carrot stick for analysis for me. I, I, I like this one, it's, it works really well, it's really quick and easy. All right, so uh, moving into the ergonomics uh, side of uh, the enhancements, we've redesigned the tablet menu to be a little bit more organized. Yes, it's a little bit bigger, but I think it's easier to read and it makes a lot more sense. So we have view-based menus in the middle, we have variants and planes at the bottom, and at the top we have sort of shading, visibility, switching things off and on. So these buttons are the ones that you can make shortcut keys for. We've also added four new ones highlighted in yellow. You can now assign text off and on, full screen mode, plain list and view list to a hotkey. So if you are really, if you like to use hotkeys a lot and a lot of experienced users do, uh, we've got some more things now to play with just to improve your workflow and speed up your, your modeling. So um, some nice enhancements there. I'm very pleased with those. Okay, this is a this is a great one. Um, if you if you have one of those enormous monitors or you have two monitors side by side, you like to make use of that space. Some people like to put all the menus on one men, on one screen and, and the graphical window on another. And with IsonSurf, that's not been so easy until today. So what we can do now is we have an option called Toggle Toolbars. Uh, let me show you how that works. So um, if I go, let's just say here and display, or it's window, sorry, <laughs> so new. Toggle toolbars, all right, and can you see what's happened? It's added these little handles to the menu, so I can pick these up and I can move them around. Now I'm just using a 17 inch laptop, so it's perhaps not sensible to change things too much right here, but if you have one of those large monitors, you can pick and choose exactly where these appear and leave them floating where you want them to be. Okay, because everybody's different, everybody likes to work in a different way. So I think this is a fantastic way to uh, really make use of your uh, screen space. You can put them anywhere. Okay, and then to get them back again, switch it off, it goes back to normal. I think that's a, that's a really helpful, helpful thing. And it's uh, tied into, a little bit, into the next feature, which is transparency. 
this is one that I really like. It's in the preferences style menu. Let's go back to that. So it, you know what it's like when you have a couple of uh, menus up. Um, let's say, uh, there we go. So you can very, very quickly have lots of menus visible. Oh, hang on. <laughs> That's what I wanted to see. You can fill up the screen with lots of menus and some of them are pretty big. Yeah, like reference manager, for example. So what we can do now is with preferences, we can make some of them transparent. So you can choose with the active menu and the other menu how transparent they are. So active, it would make sense to leave it at zero, but for other menus, you can make them almost completely disappear. So what happens is as you mouse over the menu, they spring forward. It's really snappy, it's really quick, there's no lag, certainly not on my laptop, and it's nothing special. So I think you'll really appreciate this. Um, for clearing up your space and focusing on exactly the commands that you want to see. But you can still keep the other windows there, just grayed out in the background. I really like this one. Uh, I think I'm going to be using it a lot. So there, it's under style. Yeah, you can also change the active menu, but yeah, I like to leave it opaque. All right, so um, user preferences, we can now specify where they're stored, because once again, everybody's different. You might have a certain folder that you have access to. So you, as a per user, you can say, this is where I want to keep all my preferences. All right, that makes sense, I think. So it's down here, this little, this little box by user preferences, this is where you get them. We've made some great enhancements to materials. Again, user requested enhancements. Um, this one's a real time saver. You know, if you're putting together a large reference manager session and you, uh, you're importing lots of models from various places, you sometimes end up with lots of copies of the same material. All the greens, yeah, all the pinks, you know, material one, 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 you know what I mean. So finally, um, we've added some really useful commands uh, that do a similar sort of job. There's replace and replace duplicate. So let me show you how they work. You can tell these are user requested enhancements, can you? Because these are just those little things that uh, make your life easier. So here's materials. All right. So you'll see in this one, actually, I'll do this with a different list. Um, there we go. All right, I'm just shading that. There we go, very good. All right, so we're going to materials and you've probably seen it before, all of you. Yeah, you've got lots and lots of the same colors, all these blues right here. So to start off with, there's a thing called um, replace duplicates. So what this does is every color has a numerical value. It's got a value for the, for the shades. See these numbers right here? And it's also got numbers for the reflection, transparency, and shine. So it's everything that can be numerically defined. So what replace duplicates does is it takes a look at all those numbers, and if any are uh, if any are exactly the same, then it'll just delete them and then replace them with just one material. So I'm just going to choose this one here, and I'm going to just lock that, and make that one read only, just for fun. And now let's see what happens if I do replace duplicates. Bosch. So all the materials that had those other materials assigned now only have mat one assigned to them. I hope we've made that clear. I'll repeat that. So you might have models from everywhere else coming in and they've all got various copies of exactly the same material, that the, the bright green of material one, for instance, or uh, any of the other default colors. So you end up with lots of copies of the same thing. So what with the replace duplicates button does for you is it automatically says, hey, these materials are all the same. Let's just get rid of them all and just shrink it down to just one material. And that is the material assigned to all my surfaces that had those duplicate ones. So I think that's a fantastic uh, step forward. It's a little thing, but it's a useful thing. And the next one I'm just going to show you, I'm just going to quickly assign just uh, some bright colors so you can see what I'm talking about. There we go, that'll do. All right, so now you can multi-pick your materials. I'm using the control key to pick the green and the pink. 
And then I can say, I want to replace these materials with something else. So I can now replace those with, and then you choose the one you want to replace. You say, okay, and away it goes. So super little user requested enhancements just to make your life a little bit easier. I think these are really useful, really, really good. I used to do a lot of those sorts of presentations and it was always a bit of a headache to clean up the models. Okay, let's go back to the, uh, back to the PowerPoint. Now this one, uh, there's a movie running. This is a nice enhancement. If you uh, did a projection, if you projected textures onto your surfaces in the materials, uh, sometimes when you moved them, you got some strange effects. Essentially the, the projection stayed put and the surfaces kind of moved underneath it. So now we've added a, a logistical, sorry, a, a logical arrangement where if you change the geometry, the texture assigned to it changes too. It's just a sensible enhancement that makes sense. So you see how we're spinning around this feature and the texture's moving with it. You wouldn't want the texture to reproject all the time. There we go. Uh, okay, turntable. We've, um, for those of you that uh, have turntable or use it uh, a lot, we, uh, we've really enhanced it. We've made it, we've optimized it so it, it's much smoother, and much, it works much more quickly. And we've added these uh, presets, these preset locations of the turntable. Okay, so I'll just show you that. It's, it's easy to do. So we go to um, display turntable. There it is. Okay, here's the new menu. So it's super smooth. Backwards and forwards, as you would expect. And then it has these presets. Okay, we can also move the symbol somewhere like the middle there. So preset turntable locations. I like this. Also, we can uh, do it with just this uh, thumb wheel. And we can also change the speed, so we can make it really slow. That's a bit too slow, isn't it? There we go, a nice slow turntable. So a nice enhancement to the uh, UI here. Okay, so that's turntable. All right, so I hope you've all seen um, Isensurf HMD, um, which we released it to 2018. Um, I've been enjoying using it. Um, what it gives to you is a virtual reality with an HTC Vive headset in Isensurf, but it also, it's, uh, it's presented in a bundle, which gives you access to the 3D experience virtual reality as well. Okay, so what we want to do there is allow you to explore VR into uh, the platform as well as in Isensurf. Okay. So um, the uh, the new feature here, I'm just keeping an eye on the time, is down at the bottom, calibration. This is a, a great feature. A lot of people ask me about this. When you go into a VR world, sometimes you're not entirely sure where you are. And uh, our customers occasionally like to use a seat buck or a steering wheel um, so that they can align the physical with the virtual. Okay, so calibration has been added to Isomsurf HMD, which will allow you to calibrate a physical location with a virtual location in the model. Okay, so there's an excellent movie where my friend Silva here um, will demonstrate how that works. So I'm just gonna run the movie and I'm gonna talk over it. Okay, oh, sorry, I'm, I forgot about this one. So um, you can do it by coordinate system or you can pick three points with the controller and it's up to you how you do that. So Sylvain's gonna show you using a coordinate system. So here he is, he's a bit confused because you can see on the, the TV in the background that uh, he's got a model of his desk with the monitors on, and in fact, he's much closer to his desk than it would appear in VR. So this is just Sylvain showing you, it can be kind of confusing. So what he's gonna do, he's gonna use the new calibration function uh, he's built a little uh, a little device, a little benchmark where he's putting his controller onto his physical desk. So he's actually marked it with a ruler and he's positioning it carefully in a known location next to the steering wheel, okay? So he's gonna go into Isomsurf HMD 
and he's going to say, so you see he's modeled some curves and we put a plane on there and he's going to calibrate it to a plane. So calibration, going to set up mode and he's going to choose the plane, which he'll switch on in a moment. There we go. So he's defined a virtual space in the ISOMSIF model to a physical space to his controller. I hope I'm making that clear. So he's starting the, the VR session. And now when he comes into VR, everything is exactly where it should be. So he's going to put on the headset and his location is calibrated exactly. So he's going to reach over and pick up the handset. If you look on the TV behind him, you can see there's the virtual handset. So he's now going to pick up the physical handset. Oh, in a moment, he's checking the steering wheel, but it's all in the right location. And there we go. So it's super easy to do. I hope I've explained it clearly. Um, but this really allows you to uh, mix the physical with the virtual. And there we are. That's a nice enhancement to ISOM HMD. All right. Um, infrastructure, uh, we've added, uh, we've enhanced the PAC command um, with the ability to add all those extra images, the backgrounds, the HDRs, and the texture maps. Okay, so we make a, a, a database images subfolder whenever you use the PAC command. Like, uh, I guess you must have experienced it in the past, but if you have a reference manager session, you have to go to somewhere else and you, you pack all your data somewhere, you might forget to pack all those things that make it look great, like the background and the textures. So now the pack command includes all those image files. So you have absolutely everything you need with you in a kind of, in a briefcase, you might be going into another room or you may not have access to the network or whatever. So uh, this guarantees that you have absolutely everything you need. And we've also added this to exporting ISM DBs, but um, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, we've really enhanced the uh, interface between ISM Surf and Delta Gen. Okay. So we uh, like to use Delta Gen as the high-end visualization tool for our ISM Surf. And we've now added the synchronization views button so that when you, there's the, it's, I think I'll show you the movie, it's the easiest way to do it. But we've, uh, we can attach directly in Delta Gen link files and we can synchronize the viewpoints and we can also include uh, templates, uh, starting templates to load directly into Delta Gen. So here's a movie with uh, my friend Daniel Treisman. And what he's gonna do, so he's got ISOM Surf, and he's uh, synchronizing to Delta Gen with a template file. So you can see he has the portrait of DB model in ISOM Surf, and he's attaching it as a linked file into Delta Gen automatically. There we go. So there's the model. Now with synchronized views enabled, he can work in either window and it, it, the the uh, the orientation is exactly the same. It maintains that synchronization. There's a small delay between the systems, but it, but it works really well. There we go. So now that it's in Delta Gen, um, Daniel can uh, do some global illumination, some ray tracing. So we can load a nice ambience or a nice scene into Delta Gen, an Italian piazza perhaps, and uh, do some beautiful ray tracing. Very, very high quality, very rapid uh, image production of your IsomSurf model. And because it's a linked file, it's very easy to update the data that's in Delta Gen from IsomSurf. So we've added many enhancements between IsomSurf and Delta Gen. Um, it's quite a big topic. So I think I'm looking at the time. I'm going to move on to the, uh, to the next bit, but let me see. There we go. So he linked files. So we're going to update the Delta Gen model, but I'm going to, I'm going to move on. I want to leave time for questions. So uh, data exchange. Um, it's very easy to get data in and out of IsomSurf to Katia V5 and to the 3D Experience platform and Delta Gen. Okay, 
So um, this is new. What we can do is from through the Experience Platform, we can actually export a reference manager session file. So that'll read straight into Isomsurf uh, Reference Manager. It builds a, a folder and builds a reference manager session for you automatically. So here's the video. So this is the 3D Experience platform. This model was actually created in Isomsurf, so it's, uh, it's just uh, for illustration purposes. So there we go. So we're exporting an Isom RMS, that's Reference Manager Session. Okay, and it's just writing it out. Takes a little time, there it goes. So it's written 17 files. It's keeping the structure that you can see in 3D Experience. And then we can go into Isomsurf Reference Manager and just load it directly, just like any other Reference Manager session file. There it is. And here it is. Any materials assigned in the platform come across as well. So we can enable uh, the original colors with individual. And there we go, there's the model. And there's the structure from 3D Experience. Okay, so that's a, a super enhancement for our 3D Experience platform customers. Um, we have now, uh, yeah, Export STL is now a part of ISMSF Professional, just standard K24. It's uh, standard functionality that we've incorporated into ISMSF Professional. So you don't, no longer need scan modeling to be able to do this. Uh, I mentioned before um, that we've now got pack image information for export ISMDB. Again, this is just uh, a guarantee that you're not missing any textures or uh, ambience files that you might need for uh, visualization. Uh, for our NX customers, we've enhanced the interface to Unigraphics NX. You can um, have user-defined directive files. These are the files where you store those little individual settings and parameters that uh, allow you allow you to control how NX reads the IsomSurf data. And we've added some extra parameters, uh, surf toll, no prep, and max nur have been added. So we've in, enhanced the experience for our NX users here. And uh, for those of you that like to use SVG files, uh, Adobe Illustrator files, uh, it's a, I believe it's a standard format. Um, so we can bring them straight into IsomSurf as, uh, as vector-based geometry. So if you import curves, um, so no, I need to make this, get this right. If you import just uh, wireframe objects, they will come in as curves. But if you import filled objects, like, uh, like a flood fill between curves, then it comes in as raw data. But the SG, SVG file is a standard format, and uh, it's, uh, it just makes the workflow a lot easier to get that uh, get the curve-based imagery right in there. You don't have to trace over the TIFF files anymore. Oh, you don't have to use DXF. You can actually get the native genuine data. Uh, we've um, refreshed the uh, reference manual, the online help. It's now um, very fresh, very modern, and works really nicely. So for uh, people perhaps learning the software or getting to grips with some unfamiliar bits, uh, it's a lot easier to do with uh, things like breadcrumbs, a uh, miniature table of contents, related topics, and dropdowns. So it's uh, had a great refresh. It's got a modern, fresh feel to it. So um, there we are. We've uh, reached the end of the highlights. So we've had highlights in modeling. We've had highlights in diagnostics and visualization. We had the ergonomics, like the dynamic snapping and the transparency and the toolbar toggles. And we've improved the data workflow as well. So these are the four main areas. So I'm reaching the end of the presentation. A um, few more things to say. So for licensing, so the older versions of IsomSurf, you can see what this page is, it's just telling you what, uh, what a licensing software you need to use. So since 4.13, we've been supporting DSLS, but you can see that we no longer support FlexNet or FlexLM for them since 4.13. And thing to note, if you're using the uh, Theorem 
translators, they still use FlexNet. Okay, so you still need to have FlexNet if you're using Theorem translators, but apart from that, everything is DSLS now. Um, licensing operating systems and servers. So uh, for ISO 2019, we support Windows 7 and Windows 10, 64-bit. And of course, we have to use DSLS R2019X. That's, uh, that's a must. And then at the bottom, I mentioned it earlier, for Theorem licenses, you need FlexNet version 11.8 at least. So in summary, uh, ISO 2019 was launched on the 7th of July. Uh, we have 35 new enhancements and one new command, the chamfer command. So that brings me to the end of ISO 2019. There's a little bit of time left for questions, but we also, I wanted to let you know about our uh, 3D experience conference for design, modeling, and simulation in Darmstadt. So, um, I can oh, take you over, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Before we switch over to the question, we have already some uh, on stock here. So um, I would like to let you know that we have, again, a user conference this year. It is um, happening in Darmstadt this time. And um, here you can meet and greet your peers and your user community that you met maybe last year in Hanau for the last time, so we invite you to register for the conference. The agenda is will be online soon, so um, right now we have a keynote speaker who will be Andreas Enslin from Miele, but um, there are many others um, going to be published soon, and you can also book some um, hands-on workshops that might be of interest for you um, for creative design and also for X generative design if you are working with patterns. So for this one, that's it. I would switch over to the questions and um, as you were mentioning the new versions and also the new um, um, Windows versions, we had a question from Ramona. Um, she asks that some colleagues have noticed since the Windows 10 update that ISM 2018.2 runs slower. Is this a known problem and are there any improvements in the 2019 version? Hmm. Um, I must say uh, I didn't know this was a problem. Um, I would encourage Ramona to contact their local ISM support person and uh, and investigate it. No, I'm sorry, I didn't know about that. Ramona, um, you can send me an email with your question and I will pass it to the responsible person to deal with this. So um, we have a couple more. So he was uh, one. Hi Nick, can you please show one more time the fillet function with min radius diagnostic, please? Yeah. So, um, so we uh, we've added it to Philip Plus here. So there, there's the tick box right there under at the bottom of Philip Plus minimum radius. So if I just go for uh, one from here to here, and switch off shading, and see what we get. There we go. So um, I've specified an 18 chord, and you can see clearly that uh, with a max minimum radius, sorry, a minimum radius of 15, it's just flagging up. Well, actually, it's okay. That red that you're seeing, oh, no, no, there we go. It's just violating it a little bit there. So maybe take that up to 19. There we go, and that's gone. So it's just uh, it's this tick box at the bottom of the fillet plus or the advanced fillet command. And you can just type in where you want the graphic to, from where you want it to start working. So say it's 12, make it smaller. There we go. I hope that's clear. So the idea is you can leave this on the whole time. So if you happen to know what your minimum radius is, but you're being very creative with your blends um, and you're trying to get the styling just right, you can leave this switched on when you're working and uh, it tells you immediately if you've got any issues. 
Okay. Great on a ball corner too from Peter. Thanks. Um, Caroline has another question, which is, is there, a, um, is there a possibility to save visible sections in different groups to switch them together on or off? Uh, yes, I think so. But the, the ball corner, by the way, was we, we didn't answer that one. Um, so uh, it was create. Um, there we go. I always lose that one. So no, I we don't have a minimum radius on the uh, the corner blend. Sorry, not yet. But at least that's something we can take for the next release, right? Yeah, absolutely. So for sections now, um, we have improved the section UI uh, enormously, um, where we can toggle them off and on with these uh, these ticks. So uh, I don't think we can actually save out discrete groups and sort of have them displayed off and on, but at least uh, it's a little bit easier to switch them off and on using the new uh, GUI. But this was this is 2018, so I think the answer to the question is not exactly. Okay, um, we have another one from Sebastiano from Italy. Hi mm -hmm. Nick, I'm very interested to see more of the offset option in the blend command, especially on the how the lead in works. Could you please show it again in a more detailed way? Yes. So uh, let's take a look at a blend right here. Um, so if I create a blend um, between these two surfaces, okay, there it is. What it's talking about is the offset command under the shape tab. I'm trying to make this a little easier to see. There we go. So what it does is it's going to take the first control point row of this patch here. So this was the first one I picked. So it's offset number one. And take a look what's happening. Okay, it's it's made a, a duplicate of the original because we wouldn't want to mess about with that. But it's made a, a copy of the original and it's offsetting the first control point row. Nothing else is changing, just the first control point row. So you can do it with numbers or you can drag it with your mouse and you can do it on either side. This is a very nice feature. It's uh, I mentioned it before, some people would be a little bit shocked at changing the base patch. Surely the blend would be the place to do it. But well, we all work in different ways. So uh, if you're allowed to get away with it, if it's okay to do, then then why not do it? So this is it. So I hope that's clear. A very nice feature. Thanks. Um, I move on to Samir. Samir is asking if cat part in reference manager doesn't reload in the current edition we are using. Is it fixed in 2019 version? Hmm. Well, it should work. Um, sometimes uh, there are problems when you go from one version to another because you have to tell IsomSurf, you maybe talk to your IT department, you have to tell IsomSurf exactly where the Katia is installed because what actually happens is it starts up Katia in the background to do the conversion. Okay, so you need to tell IsomSurf where Katia is installed. So that's, it's quite a technical um, thing. So um, I suggest an email to your, to your uh, support people or to your IT department and we can show you what needs to be done. But it, it certainly, it should work. Cat parts should go straight into IsomSurf with no problem at all, providing you have the right licenses, of course. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions? You can also refer back to us after the webinar. You have my email address and if you have any more questions, you can come back to me and I will forward your questions to Nick. Question regarding RM, Reference Manager. Mm -hmm. How does version 2019 reference manager handle the file structure, same as 2018 or different? Can one see an actual tree with individual geometrical stats, sets within a cat part? Great enhancements. Wow. So no, you, as far as I know, you can't see geometrical sets um, in reference manager. 
Uh, you can if you import the geometry into IsomSurf, but in Reference Manager, it's it's at a part level, like an individual file. So an individual cat part or an individual EDF or IGIS, for example. So the structure that you might see in Reference Manager is based on the f folders or the file structure. So you might have on your hard drive, you might have a file system which is project-based, the interior, exterior, and then beneath those you might have the different zones of the car or the different zones of your project. So that structure you can see, but Reference Manager uh, doesn't look inside the, the individual model, no. Thanks. That's it from Peter. I encourage you again to register to our conference where you can meet with Nick in person and ask him all the other questions that might not have been answered today and also our other experts for iSimSurf and all the other creative design solutions. So if you have no more questions, I thank you very much for your attention. And I see you soon in the next webinar or in Darmstadt. Goodbye. Bye-bye, everybody.